He said it, I didn't say it. Thank you for having me back. It's always great to be back in Paris, and uh, I'm staying here for, I guess, 11 weeks this trip, finishing up uh, the book. Last year, many of you may have seen that uh, the initial work that I had done on Metawar and the Metawar thesis wasn't complete, and I promised I would come back. And so this is gonna be about why we're fucked and what we can do about it, because one way or another, with all the technology around us, we do have to learn how to coexist with it. And we're gonna get into that. Uh, Metawar, we talked last year about it. Metawar is the battle for the control over your mind. Whether it is done by machine or man or man running a machine, whether it is social media, whether it's politicians, doesn't matter, it's for control of your mind, control of your belief systems. And last year we went through a lot of the details on how that is done. It comes down to what's the metaverse? And we hear Mark Zuckerberg and everybody, oh, the metaverse, you're gonna move in and live inside this virtual world and it's gonna be perfect. It's gonna be wonderful. The metaverse, though, I argue, is not just that. The metaverse is about storytelling, whether it is Plato, 800 BC, telling people around the campfire in Greece about the tales of brave Ulysses and the Trojan War. He immersed their mind into a narrative, into a story that for a little while they were part of. When we watch TV or a movie, the only time we are not immersed in it and part of that metaverse is when the TV glitches and we get pulled back from it, or we reach for a soda or potato chips, and suddenly we're no longer in it. We see now the entire room until the narrative, the story brings us in. In 1938, Orson Welles on the radio, just using his voice, convinced thousands of Americans that they should bring their guns out and shoot the UFOs in New Jersey because they were invading. It was a story, H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds. Along comes TV, 1939, a little more immersion, still storytelling. And the technology has moved forward throughout, but at the heart of every single bit of history, it's about the narrative. It's about the story. And how can I get you to believe it? And that is what's happening with technology now. This is where we think we're gonna go. I'm not so sure we have the technology in 100 years. Maybe something will happen, but it's about belief. And you may notice I wear that pin on all airplanes to show the pilot I deserve free drinks because I wear this pin. Works. The Metawar thesis is pretty fundamental, very simple. Eight steps, storytelling leads to, potentially if done well, a believable experience that distorts your reality. When you're reading a book, and it's a really good book, you're into the story, you are believing it, you are part of it, you are emotionally invested in that experience. TV, movie, listening to music, some people with ASMR, doesn't matter, but reality distortion, in the world that we live in today, we hear the word disinformation all the time, and I'm kind of throwing that to the side for a reason I'll show you. What we have is really too much information. Too much information that we do not know how to deal with. And when we have that, the people that have that information and are putting it out can manipulate us. They manipulate us through repetition, ultimately through a reward system of some sort, which does what? It creates addiction. And once that addiction is complete, I have compliance and belief. That is the most effective storytelling narrative that you can possibly do. And we see huge amounts of it today 
on social media with the amount of distortions that are being used for whatever the purposes are by the people that are pushing these agendas. We have two realities. One is our objective reality. We all agree, hopefully, that there's a big screen, we're all in an auditorium. We can agree it's a consensual hallucination, objective reality. What goes on inside my head or your head is your subjective reality. I cannot experience your subjective reality. The only thing you can do is try to describe it. Think about trying to describe a dream. Let's say you even remember some of the dream. Can you describe it? No, it's really exceedingly difficult. And then emotion, you feel something. How do you describe in words your subjective emotions? We can't. We have two separate systems that are always competing with each other. So is your reality bullshit or not? Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. In my case, I think most of what I think is bullshit anyway, but that allows me to get up here and learn from you guys. These are the senses. This is what creates reality. Our external senses, vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. That creates an experience in combination with our memories and what has been built into us. Then we have vestibular, which is a sense of balance, and we have precise perception, which is our external. How far is that for me? Can I guess how far that is? When I reach my hand for a glass of wine, am I gonna miss it? How well do I know my surroundings? And then interoception, that's why we get hungry. Our body is giving us a message saying, I need food, I need drink, my body needs something. So we take those senses, and what's happening with technology today, Apple has a new patented device they patented uh, just after La Hawk last year. Earbuds, 38 biosensors in it that will read all of your health and your brain waves. All of your health figures, which we consider good, do you want your brain waves being monitored by Apple or whoever else is going to be putting out this technology? Because this is the feedback. This is the feedback loop that tells them, whether it's Apple, anybody telling a story, it tells them how we are emotionally reacting, face tracking, eyeball tracking, sweat, all of these emotional responses that we are unaware of consciously are part of what they want to know. And what does ad tech want to do with this? Big tech want to do? They want to sell us more stuff. And the way they do it is through this type of feedback mechanism from our senses to the responses that we have. And it's called active meta-content orchestration. So with the, we'll put an AI there for now. It's looking at the tracking behavior, the sensor responses, and it's feeding back to us information that maybe we asked for, maybe we didn't ask for, or it thought that we should know. It made the decision. And whether it's through gaming, advertising, marketing, politics, doesn't matter what the motivation is, there is a knob, isn't there? I can tune this technology for good or for bad. We have the ability today to do it. It is being done today. And with Apple patents, et cetera, and new work that is coming out, more of our body area network, all of the information about who we are, will be going out to big tech. How are we going to coexist with that? especially when we consider 95% of the information that we receive as human beings, we are not aware we are receiving it. It is subliminal, subliminal advertising. Listening to the same radio station for 10 years 
can change people, and they don't know why. Because it's affecting a very specific part of the brain that they're not aware of. In the near future, we are going to have the ability to create these emotions in anybody who is participating in any sort of technological narrative environment, whether it's movies, headsets, VR. They're all the same, ultimately, because we are the target. And it's going to get even a little crazier. On the left here is a picture of a cute kitten. Somebody is looking at that picture. They're wearing a skull, skull cap, reading brain waves and neural patterns. That's, on the right, what the computer sees. When we have that technology deployed, which will be, and then we can do it from a distance, one meter, five meters, a hundred meters, what is left of us as humans? Do we have anything left that's private? Or are we exclusively under the influence of the people behind this technology. And what's fundamentally changing is this is the new attack surface. This is cybersecurity now and more so in the future. Having to understand what are the networks like? What are the performance specifications? What's the bandwidth? And one of the ways that I started looking at this entire problem was Let's apply cybersecurity to that mess, to cognitive security, what our brain looks like and how it behaves. Don't expect you to read it all, but we've got DOS. DOS is nothing more than information overload. When Kaylee talked about that earlier today, about getting that overwhelmed feeling. When a network gets overwhelmed, well, we know the specifications of why. We also know them with the brain, DDoS, et cetera. Do we have firewall and perimeter controls around the human mind? No, we don't. We do in the real world. ACLs, reputation. Do we have self-healing? Humans have self-healing capabilities. Technology, not so much. How can we take advantage of our own internal built-in self-healing capabilities to develop and adapt to coexistence with technology. And it goes on down the line. And if anybody wants pictures of these, please feel free. Or if you contact me, I'll get them to you. We, as a species, were not built to survive technology. We were built to survive tigers, bears. We were built to survive nature other biological systems and networks, not technological ones. We have to learn how to adapt to that which we have created. We have two systems in our head. System one is our knee-jerk reaction, that instant, we all know somebody, no matter what you say to them, their first word out of their mouth is no. We all know somebody like that. That is their system one thinking, which is not thinking. That system one fast survival mechanism. I hear a horn and a Champs Elysees, do I care? Well, automatically I'm going to say, how far away do I think it is before I freak out? Some people will freak out anyway just because of Kaylee's talk, neurodiversity. We're all a little bit different but the mechanism is absolutely the same. System two is what we think is our identity, what we think is who we are. We don't know for sure if we have identity. We may, we may not. But over 99% of the thinking that goes on in system one 400 billion bits per second of processing keeps us going, keeps us alive, keeps us surviving. 
our conscious, aware minds that when we're having a conversation and you think that you're actually creating words consciously to communicate, that is between two and four kilobits. Makes me wonder who's actually in charge of my brain. We are built, like other biological systems, for survival. We see a threat. Do we fight? Do we flee? Do we freeze in place? And I've frozen in place in certain cases, especially in VR environments. Or do you go with the Stockholm Syndrome, which is fawning, trying to make friends with your aggressor, your enemy, whoever's being hostile to you. And then the other two are evolutionary primal needs that we are, have built into us as part of our biological mandate for human survival. Yet, not everybody agrees on how well we get along with technology. Some of us love it. When it breaks, we hate it. We all know people that are terrified of technology because they think of hitting the escape button, they're going to erase the internet. They don't know. That's confusion. We have all of these different fundamental emotions that are part of our system. One, primal survival mechanism, and some of it, a little bit, with that system two, thinking. We don't know how our relationship is really defined and we're all gonna react slightly differently. But humans view technology from a lot of different ways. And it's not the same for everybody. But I, how many times do you wait three seconds on a web page and get pissed off? You have become acclimated and addicted mentally to the speed that you're expecting, that your brain is expecting. When it breaks, is it the user's fault or the, is it the tech's fault? We're going to have different views on that. How many of us ever get scrolled, hauled down a rabbit hole? We're thinking of something, oh, look at that blue blinky light. I want to go follow that one for a while. That's interesting. Suddenly it's four hours later. Tech can be a huge time waster as well. Yeah, what are we doing? We're building more and more and more and more and more of it with more and more and more information, making TMI even worse. We are disconnected from tech in six fundamental ways. And the first is information overload. The second is stress and anxiety. Look at a couple of the details in there. Then there is the algorithm that is controlling many of our lives or pieces of our lives either through the narratives being told by bad actors who are abusing technology for their own reasons, or because it's the way we like it. We, some people want to be controlled. PIB, PII is going to go away. We will have personally identifiable behavior, and that is infinitely more valuable than static data. Digital addiction, and ultimately this time disconnect because the technology is going to interface with us between a thousand and a million times faster. In that argument, in those cases, who's going to win? Us or it? Or do we disconnect? Anybody remember this, that we used to think we didn't have the internet back then, nobody had any information, therefore everybody was stupid. Today, everybody's real smart because of the internet, aren't they? So what was the real problem? It's still a human problem because it's about information and how much information the human can actually absorb and use and be productive and not be overwhelmed by those who are creating the narrative. I use 1956 sort of as the day when uh, tech arrived, and that's uh, up, I gotta get it right, the, on the plane, that is a five megabyte hard drive. But that sort of began it. And then we started building data and growing data. And the amount of data that is going on now and being built is in 
calculable and incomprehensible. We cannot think or conceive of that much information. And that alone is too much information which also adds to stress and anxiety. Some people have called it the infoglut, whatever word you wanna use. But when you look at the numbers, and by the way, every single thing in here is hard science. None of this, if I have an opinion, I'll let you know the opinion. But this is all hard science. 99.99% of all of the information is absolutely meaningless. It doesn't relate to us. Personally, my 0.001% is gonna be a little different than your 0.001%. The reason for those numbers is our maximum capacity as human beings to be able to sense and absorb information. It's our cognitive capacity. It's our bandwidth limits, if you will. So how do we go about only getting the information that I really, really want or think I want? Well, this creates a problem because disinformation is obviously a hot topic these days. A lot of political and religious overtones going on. Don't need to go in there, but there's a really interesting thing is that on the left, that is human-generated disinformation. And what we look for or the researchers look for, is quality of information. How good is it? Can it be verified? Can it be validated? How do we separate opinion and belief from actual information? So then they said, wonder what happens when we add bots to it. And on the right is what happens to the quality of information when bad actors are using the technology to disperse too much information, which creates these other problems in our mind and certainly in society as well. It becomes unmanageable and undecipherable. And that in many areas is where we're at right now. So I want you guys to write down that particular link. Up at Cambridge, there's a psychology lab run by a professor, Sander Van Linden, and they began doing some research and they wanted to find out how susceptible various groups were to disinformation. They wanted to get a handle on what it was and because of the population densities and all the available studies and opportunities, they chose the United States to pick on. And this is what they found that political leanings create a huge distinction between those that are willing to believe bullshit and those that are willing to question things and do evidentiary analytics. Then we have algorithmic anxiety. Do you trust the algorithm? I bought, uh, before a trip to London a couple months ago, I needed a new couple suitcases and did a little research, okay, and I finally picked one and bought them. Why am I still getting ads for them? Stupid algorithm, because I'm gonna buy 12 more? I don't understand, but I also realize that that's the algorithm making a decision for me. When you're on any social media, the social media algorithm has one design, to keep you there. It's called stickiness. It's all they want to do because that adds up to money. So the algorithm is designed to keep you inside its own folds. Does that worry people? I hate it. There's some cases, that, okay, I, I spam algorithm, I'm good with that. But some of these others are not only annoying, but they're abusive and it creates a given amount of stress. And how many people in this room are affected by any of these? We all are to a certain extent. You can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to me because I've seen all these, I've seen it around the world. It's identical and it is pretty much a 
across all cultures. It is not just a Western culture. So then we're going to now say, let's add in AI. Oh my God. And what does AI mean? We were listening to Solomon earlier on some stuff, and he hit some phenomenal points. But fundamentally, AI is a black box that we don't know how it works. When you ask AI a question and you get an answer, do you believe it? How much do you believe it? Do you care? Does it matter? Which biases are, being a, are, are influencing you? Is it algorithmic biases, cultural biases that are built into the algorithms, or are they data biases built in from the creators of the algorithm and the service? You don't know, and they're not telling. Yet we're connected to it. We built AI in our own image, and we don't like what we see. I like AI when huh, close is good enough, when accuracy doesn't matter, human sanity check it, and hopefully, as Asimov would suggest, when it does no harm. And I have retired from Starfleet, so I am no longer the captain of the Enterprise. What happens if AI gets angry? How are you going to know? Your own personal little AI machine, one, your little instance in GPT, how do you know that they're not fucking with you? How do you know this? We don't, because we don't know how AI works. Yet, we're getting ready to run the planet on it even more than we are now. Privacy, personally identifiable behavior, how do we kind of get around it? Well, turn off the algorithm. When it comes to addiction, there's another phrase that's used. Cut the addictive loop. Cut the loop. End the cycle of addiction. Then they spend a trillion dollars and everybody's still addicted because they never really understood what the problem was to begin with. I think Kaylee was talking about that earlier, is understanding yourself, understanding more about who you are as a human being and how you interface with all of this stuff, much less people. When it comes to the digital addiction, every time your eight-year-old daughter gets a like, her brain gives her a dose of serotonin, which feels good. Every time. More likes, more serotonin. Serotonin is addictive. We've completed the loop. Your eight-year-old daughter is now owned by the technology that's supposed to be fun, but was turned in effectively to a marketing weapon. The cognitive immune system, we haven't done anything about it. We're barely talking about it. I'm one of maybe 50 people I'm aware of on the planet that are even understanding what's going on in this area right now, and it scares the living hell out of me. This is the way the cognitive manipulation is done. That's over the, on the left. That is the human being who is trying to use critical thinking and facts and evidence in distinction to opinion and belief, which have no scientific value. On the other hand, influence and manipulation is going to use whatever tools that are going to affect your brain to get you to act and or behave or believe the way that the people are running the algorithms, running these in disinformation centers, running too much information around the planet. This is how it works. But when we apply cybersecurity to it, we have some hope. Uh, cybersecurity, uh, we don't have self-healing, but we do have a perimeter control uh, that works semi sort of kind of, uh, okay, we'll go with firewalls and ACLs and all of that. But we also have, in cyber, something else is that, all right, we'll go with an anomaly detection system. And in comes all of this information, just pouring in. The SIM, the IDS, is looking for, oopses, looking for 
errors, looking for something that is different. And what happens when it finds it? There's a pause. That information goes over for secondary inspection. Wonder really what's going on here. And the reason that happens is so that the primary processing system isn't overloaded with secondary analysis. Secondary analysis takes a lot of effort, a lot of CPU to really do its job right. So we have a model that comes from cybersecurity that is potentially can be applied to cognitive security. When somebody immediately says no, or they have a gut reaction, of course it's that way. How do you know? Well, I just know. Is there any value in that statement? Maybe, maybe not. But that is a system one reaction. When you ask somebody a question, and when you challenge them in certain ways, the goal is to engage system two, that very slow, methodical processing to try to help out that secondary level of processing, to try to bring some sanity to the information that's being fed to you, whether it's technical inside of an IDS or in the human. Same process. And these systems exist as self-healing systems inside of human beings. So normally, in a loop, we're going to have the observe, orient, decide, act. Normal OODA loop, circular, just keep going. That's how systems survive. That's how bio uh, systems survive. That's how everything survives. What needs to be done, and occasionally happens, is we need to change that orient to pause. Just get it to, just think for a second. Pause, go into that secondary analysis, bring it over to the other server, let's do a deeper dive on it, bring it to the front of your mind, and how about actually thinking about it for the first time? Same thing we've done with time-based security since 1996, when we first came up with these circuits and models and the mathematics behind it. We know how it works. I just had never thought about applying it to cognitive security until last year after doing some work here and up in, up in Holland. Just pause, oh, it sounds so simple. Uh, the drugs in the, uh, just say no. Don't take drugs, just say no to this, just, just, but that is not us, that is not human, because we are largely run by system one. System one's got us on automatic, whether it's helpful or self-harmful. Kaylee went into this in great detail. We don't know ourselves well enough. But the goal with pausing is to engage system two. When you're a kid, and we've all done it to our kids, and they're freaking out about something, and you go, calm down, count to 10, just take a breath. What woman hasn't told a woman friend of hers, I just told my husband something, he doesn't get it, Give him two days, he'll figure it out on his own. Take a pause. Engage your cognitive system to capabilities, which are slow, methodical, are not going to give you answers as quickly as system one, because system one, which operates off of opinion and belief largely, is mostly wrong when it comes to information. It's mostly right when it comes to our physical survival. We were built for that. We were not built for technology. So let's play a game for a moment. And let's go back to 1961. Dr. William McGuire said, after doing investigations with the army, with propaganda, uh, mental torture, all of those sorts of things that you've heard the stories about, MK Ultra kind of stuff, said, I know how to fix it. And he called it a vaccine for brainwashing. And it's a very, very simple process that he called inoculation theory. I'm not particularly a fan of that term, but I have to, it's now become part of the academic vernacular. And he said, very simply, pre-bunking. 
Tell somebody you're going to lie to them to their face. Tell them, I'm going to tell you that the sky is red. What is your brain automatically going to do? It has just hit a little bit of an absurd condition, which turns on system two. You say, Wynn, you're really full of shit. No, Wynn, you're colorblind, or Wynn, you're messing with my mind. Somewhere in there lies really what's happening. Pre-bunking has been proven over the last 60 years to be an effective way to get people to turn on system two through a self-healing, mental, cognitive strengthening technique that doesn't matter what the issue is. It could be anything. It doesn't matter. Because it's the process. It's getting the brain to think about itself. Question itself. Question its own system one automatic reactions, automatic belief systems to say, wait a minute. Am I fooling myself? To set another OODA loop, it's the same thing. Going through this process. And the process has to get automatic within us. Now, geeks, a lot of us have this automatically built in. You're having a bar conversation with somebody and somebody makes a claim. Uh, I just tacked four alien spaceships. <laughs> yeah, right. Somebody else might go, where? What's the difference between those two people? Believability, evidence, and the difference between the two. So Cambridge put together a framework, an operational framework with gaming that is called Depict. When you hear people argue sometimes, for example, uh, discrediting. Um, uh, Kaylee says something, and you believe half of what she says. And I said, don't listen to her. She's an idiot. And that's all I say. What does that do to your brain? How do you get your brain to not believe that Kaylee's an idiot? Through gaming. And there's all of these basic techniques that have been developed. And if you have an opportunity, go take the bad news game. It's free. It's out of the Cambridge Psychology Labs. And it trains you to be able to Begin to call out your own bullshit. To question things a lot more than just blatantly accepting a cultish type of behaviors and, and words and actions. They've done an amazing job. They've done it over, the last number I heard was 3 million people. The bad news game takes uh, five minutes to play. They did a series of experiments with these two million people and discovered pre-testing, taking, playing the game, post-testing, that the susceptibility to disinformation, which was what they were studying, the susceptibility went down by 49% by playing the game once. If you play the game more, you're going to get better effects. And over time, like any inoculation, you got to tune the system up. You got to, well, we're used to patching. Well, patch Tuesday, let's go play another bad news game. Or the work that's coming out of Australia and of this incredible woman, M Melanie uh, Tracy King, they've developed a whole series of games taking the same principle that McGuire had back in 61 that Lewandowski had in 2006, and that Van Linden's group out of Cambridge University have perfected, taking the same approach to let the brain strengthen itself, not by propaganda, not by teaching, not by any content, merely by the process of allowing the system one portion of your brain to question things and not accept bullshit so much. There's a whole series of the games. One of the ones that uh, we've been talking about 
We know how to do a cyber range, red, blue, teaming, you know, all of that. We know how to do that. We've been doing it for 25 years. Well, there's one being developed for cognitive defense. That's going to be an interesting one to see. Is it human on human, multiple humans on multiple humans? And are there AIs in the middle of it that you may or may not know are AIs? That's the real world that could be replicated by cybersecurity people and brought into experimental psychology. We know how to do this bit. They know how to pose the questions and pose the various issues that are going to make the brain go into self-healing mode. One of the things that is also critical to this whole process is learning critical ignoring. What do I just not give a shit about? A lot. Then why am I doom scrolling? Why am I reading the, reading the wrong newspaper? Why am I talking to friends that I don't know? Why am I accepting? Why am I doing all of these things? Do you question them? And this gets to TMI. You have all this stuff coming at you. What's the filtering mechanism? We know the filtering mechanisms between firewalls and ACLs and technology. What's yours? Kaylee was asking that question as well. What is yours? How do you filter the information overload that's coming at you every single day about do you care about it? Do you have the time for it? Do you trust it? Or is that just an AI bot on the back end? Don't forget the difference between quantity and quality makes itself more and more evident these days when we have TMI raging at us the way that it is. I want you to read this, because disinformation warfare, cognitive warfare, is nothing new. I call it class three metawar because it's nation state, NGO, large, organ, uh, large political, religious organizations around the world that are using these kinds of techniques that were conceived and used, well, we'll go with World War II on, then with McGuire's work from 1961 on, when he was doing a, how do you fix people that have been brainwashed? So I got a question. How many of these types of projects are going on in the EU and UK right now. Shout out a number. What? One? Who are you? No. How many? Five. Zero. To the tune of about five billion euros a year in public-private investment into cognitive defense. How many in the US? What? The EU has cared about this deeply for quite a while. The work and the experiments that are being done out of the psychology labs are supporting it the gaming, the inoculation, the mental cognitive strengthening of our mental immune system. Just like in our biological immune system, we get a polio vaccine so we don't get polio. We get a COVID vaccine so hopefully if we get it, it's not so bad. The exact same capabilities are built into our mental system, into our cognitive system, and we have the ability and I argue that cybersecurity people can help a huge amount. Because when I talk to these guys, they're kind of, you really have tools that will solve this stuff? Right now in the US, we do not have a national mandate like portions of the EU do, like Finland does, like Scandinavian countries have, to protect the mental cognitive abilities and awareness and skill sets of our citizens. We don't have it. And one of the reasons we don't have it 
is because two years ago it started getting shut down by certain political forces in the U.S. The last one was shut down 10 days ago, Stanford Internet Observatory. We're kind of nowhere right now, and we're, certainly I am looking at the EK, UK and EU a great deal for, we got to figure something out and work together on this. So how do we scale this? How do you turn these kinds of things into national level programs? Well, in the US, believe it or not, the lottery tickets, we sell $100 billion a year in lottery tickets. A hundred billion. The odds of winning are exceedingly low. The house odds, when you compare it to Vegas, go to Vegas and have a ball. Don't play the lottery because you're a guaranteed loser virtually. But now imagine taking some of Trasic's games or John, uh, John's games or the Vanderlinden's games and applying them across an entire country. The entire country gets to pick, I want to play this game, I want to play this game, I want to pay, play a game. And somebody puts up a billion bucks. For us, that's chump change. A billion bucks, and there's some payouts. You got, what, 100 million players. Make it a million will winners, because right now, from a psychological standpoint, Lottery winners make 300 million or a billion or some insane amount of money and everybody else loses. What if every month there was a million winners? What happens to the psychology of the people that are playing? Not only do they get the benefit of the cognitive strengthening of the process, they feel good about actually having a chance at being a winner. How do we do it? Oh, there's rewards for everybody. Everybody wants different kinds of rewards. I don't want to get into the details, but we, the advertising industry, marketing industry, they know how to do that. We know how to do the geeky stuff. What sort of games? Well, we could have mystery games, puzzles, crypto games. It, it doesn't matter what the game is. I'm gonna let the social psychologists figure that one out. That's not my skill set. But we need all of these people talking to each other if we care enough to try to coexist with humanity. So what do we want to do with some of these things? Here are some of the ideas as to how to approach it. Digital provenance. What's real? What's not real? Right now we don't have much capability for doing that. Um, mental health, anxiety. Talk to KMELT on that one. I'm not the expert on it. But this can be built into educational systems as they're doing in Scandinavian countries right now, building cognitive strengthening from pre-kindergarten all the way through and offering cognitive strengthening programs as adult upskilling so that new jobs and new opportunities come with strengthened mental immune systems as well. Those are some of the skill sets we need, but what we need is fucking hackers. You guys, I don't think I've surprised you too much here. I don't think the technology I'm talking about is all that strange to you. I don't think that the ideas about what we can do are all that difficult because we've all done them in one way or another already. We have a lot to learn. We have a lot to put together, a lot of pieces. We need some national will everywhere in the world. I was talking to the folks up in Holland on this uh, last week, and I was invest asking about their national programs, and they were kind of going, eh, not really yet. Scandinavia has a different culture, different mindset. We need people that are not scared to have dissonance in their face, to face paradox and understand and accept that it is a paradox and you may never completely understand it, but still be able to deal with it. Silicon defense, carbon defense. 
It's not all that different. The processes are the same. They're still systems. And the systems and the operations operate in feedback loops. They operate in OODA loops. And we've mapped them. All of the maps exist. It's a matter of doing it. We got one choice as a species. Adapt and coexist. Thank you very much for your time.